Um, Good to see you. Am I right? You're in Jerusalem at the moment. That's it. <laughs> Very good. Out of Tov, then. Uh, here, it's, here it's noon. Erwin, I was looking a little while ago at one of our booklets from a past conference. It was six years ago. You were the keynote speaker at the time. The conference was called Anti-Zionism, Anti-Semitism, and the Dynamics of Delegitimization. My gosh, Irwin, uh, in the years since then, the subject far from fading has in fact become even worse. And I'm sure we'll learn from what you have to tell us today. Um, to all of you uh, tuning in, um, a brief word, but only a brief word about Irwin Cutler, were I to really uh, do him justice and let you know about his very distinguished career, I would take up much too much time. Suffice it to say that Erwin Cutler is one of the most prominent, most active, and most effective legal minds of this generation. He's had a distinguished career in academic life, in government life, and also as an active international human rights attorney as well. He taught for many years at McGill University in his native Canada. Uh, he served his government as justice minister and also attorney general, uh, during which time he saw through any of a number of important innovations. Um, in his work as an active international human rights attorney, he played a major role, in fact, in helping prisoners of conscience, including people like Andrei Sakharov, Natan Sharansky, Nelson Mandela, Kobo Timmerman, and numerous others. I last saw Erwin, I believe, in Jerusalem, pre-pandemic, and uh, we, so we, we use the R word, namely retirement, because as we looked at one another, we saw that we were both approaching middle age. And <laughs> I, said, <laughs> I, said, I said to Erwin, no, what, <laughs> what, what's ahead? I know your wife would like to have you spend some more <laughs> time with her and... Uh, he knows no more about the R word retirement than I do. So to our eternal benefit, in fact, Erwin Cutler remains very active. He heads up the Raoul Wallenberg Center, which he founded for human rights and more recently was named his government's um, official for Holocaust remembrance and combating anti-Semitism. Last week, those of you who tuned in heard Fernando Luttenberg, who plays a somewhat similar role in the OAS, and Irwin has that assignment, among many others, in Canada. Irwin, it's a great pleasure, as always, to see you next time, uh, I hope face-to-face, -face, but for now, it's good to see you over Zoom, and the floor is yours. Thanks, Alvin. You, you referenced... Uh six years ago when I was in Indiana, I just want to uh, reaffirm what I said then because the six years has actually uh, dramatized what I said then, and that is your own personal leadership, your own moral and intellectual authority in the combating of anti-Semitism and your institute uh, having emerged really as the torchbearer for the scholarship and obviously with respect to anti-Semitism in our time. I said that then, but I think events since then have more than uh, validated uh, my referencing it at the time. As it happens, we meet at an important moment of, of remembrance and reminder because we are meeting in the uh, aftermath of International Holocaust uh, Remembrance Day, uh, commemorating the 77th anniversary of the liberation of the death camp Auschwitz, the most brutal extermination camp of the 20th century, a laboratory for mass murder where there are no uh, graves. 
1.3 million people were deported to the death camp Auschwitz. 1.1 million of them were Jews. Let there be no mistake about it. Jews were murdered at Auschwitz because of anti-Semitism. But anti-Semitism itself did not die at Auschwitz. It remains the bloody canary in the mineshaft of global evil today. Toxic to democracies, as Ahmed Shahid has put it, and an assault on our common uh, humanity, which underpins the themes of my remarks today. Indeed, we are witnessing an old, new, escalating, intensifying, resurgent, <coughs> sophisticated, virulent, and lethal anti-Semitism, grounded in classical anti-Semitism, but distinguishable from it, which first found its institutional, international, juridical expression in the then UN Zionism as Racism Resolution of 1975, which uh, the US ambassador to the UN at the time, Daniel Moynihan aptly characterized it as, <clears throat> in effect, giving the abomination of anti-Semitism the appearance of international legal sanction. But it has gone dramatically beyond that. A new anti-Semitism, which we sometimes say we need a new vocabulary to define it, but which can best be characterized and best analyzed using a human rights lens. In fact, using what I would call an equality rights lens. In other words, traditional or classical anti-Semitism is a discrimination against, denial of, assault upon the rights of Jews to live as equal members in whatever society they inhabit. The new anti-Semitism is a discrimination against, denial of, assault upon the right of Israel and the Jewish people to live as an equal member of the family of nations. What is common to both forms of anti-Semitism, traditional and new, is discrimination. All that has happened is that we've moved from discrimination against Jews as individuals to discrimination against Jews as a people and reverberating back on discrimination against Jews as individuals. Indeed, this is an initial looking glass into anti-Semitism as the oldest, longest, most enduring, and most dangerous of hatreds. One, however, that mutates and metastasizes over time, but it's grounded in one generic foundational historical trope. And that is the notion of Jews, the Jewish people, Israel as being the enemy of all that is good and the embodiment of all that is evil, reflecting and representing whatever is the particular zeitgeist, whatever is the particular canon, the particular good at any given moment in time. So when Christianity was the zeitgeist of what was a good, then Jews were held to be responsible for deicide. When in the Middle Ages, at the time of the Black Plague, Jews were held out to be the enemy and embodiment of evil as the poisoners of the wells. But particularly of relevance for our discussion today, for the last 50 years, when human rights has emerged as it were as a new secular religion of our time, when Father Robert and Congressman Robert Drinan wrote in 1975 that the emergence of human rights as an international juridical norm, as he put it, is the most dramatic development in the history of contemporary jurisprudence. So human rights emerge as a new secular religion of our time. But what was happening and happening almost imperceptibly was that Israel and the Jewish people were being characterized as the new meta human rights violator of our time. 
Let me give you just one example, if I may, from 1974, a snapshot from 1974, one year before the Zionism is racism resolution. And so it was then that Israel was held out to be the enemy of labor. Evidence, the resolution of the International Labor Organization condemning Israeli suppression of Palestinian trade unionism. The enemy of health, evidence, the resolution of the World Health Organization condemning Israeli poisoning of Palestinians in the West Bank. I could use the word alleged, but these were determinations. May I add that last year, Israel was held out to be the only violator of health rights in the world. The enemy of culture, evidence, the resolution of UNESCO condemning Israeli desecration of historic Palestinian sites in Jerusalem and the West Bank. The enemy of human rights, evidence, the resolution of the UN Human Rights Commission, the precursor to the UN Human Rights Council, condemning Israel as a major human rights violator. The enemy of peace, evidence, the resolution of the UN General Assembly condemning Israel and Israel alone as a non-peace loving nation. And the enemy of women, evidence, the resolution of the UN Commission on the Status of Women condemning Israel's repression of Palestinian women. And so you have it then. And this is in 1974. And understand that this has been repeated and reaffirmed since, that Israel is the enemy of labor and health and culture and human rights and peace and women rights. Israel as the enemy of all that is good is the embodiment also of all that is evil. This process of delegitimization and demonization, this application of double standards has been proceeding imperceptibly, indulgently, inexorably for some 50 years now. The whole launder under the protective cover of the United Nations, under the authority of international law, under the culture of human rights, under the struggle against racism. This has had a particular resonance in a country like Canada, but not only in Canada, where, for example, the United Nations is part of our DNA. International law is held out to be a centerpiece of our identity. Human rights is held out to be an organizing idiom of our foreign policy. Anti-racism is held to be the most compelling of our uh, credos. But this finds expression elsewhere. And all this reached a tipping point in the World Conference Against Racism in Durban in 2001. I have to say that when I first heard that there was going to be a World Conference Against Racism in Durban in September 2001, I greeted this with anticipation if not excitement. This was going to be the first anti-racism conference of the 21st century, the first world conference in which anti-racism was its organizing theme. This was to be the first international human rights conference of the 21st century, where the promotion and protection of human rights was to be its organizing theme. And this was to take place in Durban, South Africa, the birthplace of apartheid, and to commemorate the dismantling of apartheid. As someone who had been involved in the anti-apartheid movement, who had been arrested as I was in South Africa in 1981, in advocacy against apartheid, I looked at this not only, as I say, with interest, excitement, anticipation, but I thought this would be a historic commemorative event. But what happened in Durban, South Africa, if I may use an oft abused metaphor, was truly Orwellian. A world conference against racism and hate turned into a conference of racism and hate against the Jewish people. A world conference that was to proceed to promote and protect human rights singled out one state and one people for selective opprobrium and indictment. A conference that was to commemorate the dismantling of the Jewish 
dismantling of South Africa as an apartheid state called for the dismantling of Israel as an apartheid state. Alvin, I can tell you as I meet uh, with you and, and those on this Zoom, I can still see the images of Durban. I can still hear the chanting in Durban. I can still see the thousands of demonstrators in the streets chanting that the struggle against apartheid in the 20th century required the dismantling of South Africa as an apartheid state and the struggle against apartheid in the 21st century requires the dismantling of Israel as an apartheid state. As someone who was in Durban as a member of the Canadian delegation, I have to say that these chants and these images have indelibly impacted themselves not only on my memory, but on my being. As I say, I can still hear the chants, I can still see the images, the posters, the placards saying too bad that Hitler didn't finish the job. The posters and placards condemning Israel not only as an apartheid state, but also as a Nazi state. I still see young students at the NGO forum, young Jewish students being assaulted and being told you don't belong to the human race. And I can go on, but this was the remembrance of Durban. I flew back on September 10th from South Africa to Montreal only to wake up on September 11th, as we all did, to the horrors of 9-11. But as one of my colleagues who had been in Durban said to me later that day in a telephone call, said, what happened in 9-11 may have been the Kristallnacht of terror, but Durban was the Mein Kampf. Durban was the framing for what is happening now. And what happened in the immediate aftermath of Durban bears recall at this point, because in the immediate aftermath of Durban, Jews were blamed for 9-11. In the immediate aftermath of Durban, the UN Commission on Human Rights, that was then called, now the UN Council on Human Rights, convened to put one state in the docket of the accused. That state was Israel. What happened in the aftermath of Durban was that at the University of Michigan, the BDS movement was launched. In fact, Israel as an apartheid state campaign was launched in the campus culture. There was a resolution proposed at the University of Michigan, which called for a two-state solution if Israel were to become a democratic state, a resolution problematic in and of itself. Interestingly enough, that resolution was defeated and replaced by a resolution that called for the dismantling of Israel as an apartheid state. And then came perhaps the most disturbing assault on human rights and disturbing assault on our common uh, humanity, both in historical and contemporary perspective. That was in the immediate aftermath of Durban, the contracting parties to the Geneva Convention, the repository of international humanitarian law, met for the first time, 52 years later after the adoption of the Geneva Convention, to put one state in the docket of the accused. It was not Sudan, it was not Syria, it was not Sierra, it was not any of the countries where massive human rights violations were taking place, let alone might have otherwise been taking place, China, Russia, and elsewhere. The only country put in the docket of the accused by the contracting parties to the Geneva Convention, as I said, the repository of international humanitarian law, was Israel. And this has been repeated twice since. I say all this because it's important to understand, and I want to put mention just two caveats, perhaps I should have uh, said this at the beginning in terms of framing my remarks. Nothing of what I am saying or sharing with you is intended to suggest that Israel is somehow above the law, 
or that the Jewish people should enjoy any particular privilege or preference because of the horrors of a Jewish history or the Holocaust, not at all. My whole point is, is that Israel is being systematically denied equality before the law. Not that it should be above the law, but that it deserves equal protection under the law. Not that Israel should not respect human rights, on the contrary, she must, like any other state, but the human rights of Israel deserve equal respect. Not that human rights standards should not be applied to Israel, not at all, but these standards must be applied equally under the principle of equal protection and equal treatment before and under the law. Similarly, none of this is intended to suggest that Israel cannot be criticized, not at all. It can be subjected to rigorous criticism. Its violations, as I mentioned, can in fact be identified and critique and redress can be sought. But we are speaking here about crossing the line into an anti-Semitism that becomes an assault on our common humanity. And this brings me, if I may, to just very quickly identify four or five indicators of this assault on our common humanity, which were not necessarily initiated by the World Conference Against Racism in Durban, but were intensified by that conference and have continued to metastasize these past 20 years. The first is what I would call genocidal anti-Semitism. This is not a word that I use easily or lightly. What I'm referring to here is the toxic convergence of the advocacy of the most horrific of crimes, namely genocide, embedded in the most horrific of hatreds, namely anti-Semitism, and finding public expression in the public call for incitement to hatred and genocide of the Jewish people, that which is prohibited under the Genocide Convention. What is sometimes forgotten is that the Genocide Convention prohibits incitement to genocide, not just acts of genocide. And the Supreme Court of Canada put it that the very incitement constitutes the crime, whether or not acts of genocide follow. And so it was then that the 21st century began on January 3rd, 2000. And I suspect that this is not terribly well known if it ever was known at all, with a public call by the Supreme Leader of Iran, Atollah Khamenei, a public call for the destruction of Israel when he spoke as follows, that there can be no resolution to the Arab-Israeli conflict without the annihilation of the Jewish state. A public call made, as I said, at the outset of the 21st century, paralleled by similar uh, public calls uh, coming from Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah. I can go on. But the point in all this is that these are acts prohibited under international law. Yet no state, no state has yet held Iran publicly to account in international legal forms for its public incitement to genocide. On the contrary, the reverse has happened. And that is why there's a kind of double assault on our common humanity. Not only the standing incitement to the genocide of Israel and the Jewish people, but in fact, the indicting of Israel and the Jewish people as being themselves responsible for genocidal acts, which leads me to the second uh, phenomenon of an assault on our common humanity. And I'm referring here to, uh, if I may use the term, I've used it when I was there six years ago, Alvin as being ideological anti-Semitism, but I think it's even more in its intensification might be called demonological anti-Semitism. By that, I'm referring to the ongoing indictment of Israel and the Jewish people as a racist, imperialist, colonialist, settler state, ethnic cleansing, child murdering, apartheid, 
genocidal Nazi state. All these epithets of indictment, which have been manifesting themselves over this past uh, 20 year period. As I say, sometimes indulgently, inexorably, but this critical mass of indictment, which is on the one hand, an assault on our common humanity is actually, actually done and laundered under the alleged principle of our common humanity. Let's face it, and this is my referencing here of the Amnesty International uh, recent report. The worst thing you can say about any person or people or state is to call them a racist. The very label sometimes itself supplies the indictment. No further proof is required. But if any further proof is required, then you refer to Israel as an apartheid state. Because apartheid is defined under international law as a crime against humanity. If Israel is an apartheid state, then Israel is an ongoing crime against humanity. If it's an ongoing crime against humanity, also referenced in the apartheid in the apartheid indictment in the Amnesty International Report, then it has no right to be. Indeed, not only does it have no right to be, but when you add all those other demonological indictment epithets in terms of being a racist, apartheid, Nazi, genocidal state, not only does it have no right to be, but we, the international community, have a responsibility to see that it has no right to be. And so it is then that all these dynamics of anti-Semitism, themselves an assault on our common humanity, are yet again, and I may use an oft abused Orwellian metaphor, are being laundered, as it were, under the pretext of protecting our common humanity. And this leads to a third dynamic of this uh, anti-Semitism, that is political anti-Semitism. By political anti-Semitism, very quickly, I'm referring to four variants of it that have been uh, here too metastasizing over these last uh, 20 years. And that is denial of Israel's legitimacy, if not its right to exist, denial of the Jewish people's right to self-determination, if not even the fact that the Jews even constitute a people. One could cite chapter and verse of these four variants of uh, political uh, anti-Semitism, but this here too is to be added uh, to these epithets of indictment. And finally, and I'll just mention it because time does not permit going into it, and that is, you know, terrorist anti-Semitism, where in fact, uh, Jews are targeted in Israel and outside of Israel. And that has been happening for the last 20 years in a kind of terrorist anti-Semitism that tends to have with it a whole series of exculpatory disclaimers. So much then for the first tipping point. Let me move quickly and go to the second tipping point. And the second tipping point was the Hamas war against Israel in May 2021, where Jews were threatened in there. And I'm using for a moment, just Canada as a case study, but the globalization phenomenon is that this was replicated in other uh, countries and communities as well, where Jews were threatened and targeted in their neighborhoods and in the streets, on the campuses and in the communities, where synagogues were torched, Holocaust memorials defaced, cemeteries desecrated, Jewish institutions vandalized, all of which found empirical expression in two indicia. The first is that whereas, for example, in Canada, from 2016 to 2020, we had increasing rises of hate-motivated crimes against Jews, and 2020 was recorded as the year in which the most hate crimes ever targeted the Jews, the most targeted of minorities in Canada. By May 2021, we had reached the level of the entire year of 2020. And this was paralleled by an incendiary explosion in hate on the internet, in the amplification of hate 
in the social media. Whereas we know in one week alone in May 2021, there were 17,000 tweets that Hitler was right. I'm not even referencing uh, the instrumentalization and weaponization of the COVID pandemic to accuse Jews, the Jewish people and Israel for having manufactured the pandemic, for having caused its spread, for even profiting from it, let alone uh, the <clears throat> misappropriation, an understated term of both uh, <clears throat> the yellow star of David, or in fact, where <clears throat> anti-vaxxers compare themselves to inmates of Auschwitz. Phenomenon of not only Holocaust uh, distortion, but uh, trivialization. And so what has concerned me in all this that I've described have been a number of dynamics, a number of dynamics that I've observed in my first year as being a special envoy, as you mentioned, for preserving Holocaust remembrance and combating anti-Semitism. The first is, whereas we tend to characterize anti-Semitism in a kind of uh, triangular approach, anti-Semitism from the far right, anti-Semitism from the far left, anti-Semitism from radical uh, Islam, while that has conventional uh, appreciation as validity, it has become, frankly, much more uh, disturbing than that. For what we have been witnessing, and I've seen this in my first year, has been what I would call the mainstream, the normalization, the legitimation of anti-Semitism in the political culture, in the campus culture, the absence of outrage, the whole underpinned by indifference and inaction, the first disturbing dynamic. The second has been the globalization phenomenon and how that globalization phenomenon finds expression is itself interesting. When in May, 2021, here's the point that I wanna make that what happens in London and Paris, for example, reverberates in Montreal or Toronto or New York or California. Because when you had convoys going through the streets of London, England, saying, F the Jews will rape your daughters, you had the same convoys then going through the streets of Canada, almost not as a matter of happenstance, but more as an example of a kind of orchestrated campaign of incitement and uh, delegitimization. So that's the second, the phenomenon of globalization. The third, and this is something I found in my work as Special Envoy, was the marginalization of anti-Semitism in the overall struggle against racism. By marginalization, I can tell you that I've looked into education and training programs, both within and without the government of, of Canada. And what I find is while there is rightly so, rightly so education and training to combat systemic discrimination against indigenous people, against blacks and people of color, against Asian Canadians, against Muslims, each and all of which we should be engaged in. Yet the combating of anti-Semitism was somehow marginalized, if not in fact excluded from those training programs. And I'm speaking about those that I've looked at and have been reporting upon. So that's the third phenomenon. But the fourth, and the one that I found most disturbing has been the launder of anti-Semitism under the very cover of anti-racism itself. And where, for example, Jewish students in the campus culture are forced to choose between their Jewish identity and being accepted in the campus culture, where they are increasingly stereotyped as being part of the white privileged class or worse and at the same time indicted for being apologists for the white supremacist state of Israel in the Middle East. The kind of thing that is furthered by uh, the report of Amnesty International and the use of the apartheid uh, indictment. So these four phenomena are things that I have found in my first year to be particularly disturbing. That's why I was pleased that the Canadian government organized 
the first ever that I know of, of any country of a national summit to combat anti-Semitism in late July, which brought together the, uh, the prime minister, uh, ministers of uh, important uh, government ministries responsible for the combating of anti-Semitism, brought together uh, a cross section of parliamentarians, a diverse representation of Jews and interestingly enough, uh, the prime minister who opened uh, the conference was particularly as he himself acknowledged, particularly not only taken aback, but disturbed by two pieces of testimony. One was that of a University of Toronto student who as he characterized himself was part of the progressive left, yet found himself marginalized or excluded from the campus culture because he was stereotyped as being part of the white privileged class and apologist for Israel. The second was a, a woman of color, a Jewish woman of color, who, as she put it, embodied intersectionality. She was a woman, <clears throat> she was a person of color, she was a Jew, but as she indicated, she was targeted most because of her Jewishness as a woman, a Jewish woman of color. And it was the prime minister himself who then invoked at the end of that conference, the need as a matter of priority and principle for Canada to combat, as he put it, delegitimization, demonization, uh, double standard, the three Ds, uh, which he attributed to me to having shared with him, but actually uh, Sharansky was the author of that. And then came country pledges at the Malmo conference in uh, Malmo, Sweden, where each of the countries attending this international conference in October on preserving Holocaust remembrance and combating anti-Semitism was asked to make country pledges, which are now to be monitored for their implementation in 2022, when Sweden assumes the presidency of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. And may I close uh, by putting forth what I did at the National Summit to Combat Anti-Semitism, uh, but refined uh, since then by my work as Special Envoy, a, sit, a set of objectives for us, objectives as a community of scholars. How do we combat this anti-Semitism, which is an assault on our common humanity and which is being, in fact, laundered as if it is protecting our common humanities. I have sought to share with you. The first is uh, the importance, as I've learned this past year, of uh, Holocaust commemoration and commemoration of historical events that are actually very often unknown. For example, this year we commemorated the 83rd anniversary of Kristallnacht. Now we know Kristallnacht, the torching of synagogues, etc. But what is sometimes ignored when we speak of Kristallnacht as the gateway to the Holocaust is that Kristallnacht itself did not happen by accident. When some 30,000 Jews were rounded up in those two days to be deported to the concentration camps, what is oft ignored is that Dachau, the infamous Dachau concentration camp, was actually established in 1933, that the Nuremberg race laws were enacted in 1935, that state sanction incitement to hatred in the democracy of Germany was going on from 1933 to 1938. The whole point here is the dangers, the dangers not only of la trahison declare the betrayals of the intellectuals, that Nuremberg crimes were the crimes of the Nuremberg elites, but the dangers of bystander communities. And so we have sought in my period as a special envoy to commemorate these events, whether it be Kristallnacht, whether it be the 80th anniversary of Babi Yar, whether it be International Holocaust Remembrance, so that we learn the lessons of history, not simply as lessons that are confined to history, but which have important uh, lessons for us in terms of our responsibilities to act on those lessons today. That anti-Semitism, as I said, is toxic 
to democracies. And democracy itself doesn't happen and maintained by accident one has to work on. The second thing that I want to mention is the importance and the imperative of not only Holocaust education, but what you, Alvin, are doing with your community of scholars, but education with regard to anti-Semitism. Of the Holocaust as a paradigm for radical evil, but anti-Semitism as a paradigm for radical hate. We've seen studies in the US and in Canada which demonstrate that 50% of millennials cannot name one concentration camp. I've never even heard of Auschwitz. That's only one part of the story. The other part, as a study just uh, exposed in Canada, was that some 33% of high school students believe that the Holocaust and stories about it are actually fabricated or exaggerated. And when we speak about uh, Holocaust education, it cannot be something that, as I said, is consigned to the past. It has to be conjoined together with education about anti-Semitism. And that's why I began our talk today uh, with regard to that of 1.3 million people deported to the death camp. 1.1 million of them were Jews murdered because of anti-Semitism, but anti-Semitism still the canary in the mind shaft of global evil today. And so the important imperative of uh, learning about the Holocaust and learning about anti-Semitism, the encouraging thing in this data that came out in this high school study that was released uh, two weeks ago in Canada was that 92% of those high school students wanted to learn more about the Holocaust and anti So therefore there is a willingness to learn and it has become uh, not only important because of the level of ignorance, but because in that study it was also shown that 40, over 40% 40 of uh, their knowledge about the Holocaust comes from the social media. And this brings me to the third dimension, the need to combat Holocaust denial, distortion, trivialization, minimization, inversion, and the like. The fourth thing, and what we also found is that uh, very few stu students knew that Raoul Wallenberg was Canada's first honorary citizen. A person who demonstrated how one person with the compassion to care and the courage to act can confront evil, prevail and transform history. Well, the United States, Wallenberg's also an honorary citizen. From my meetings with university students, et cetera, in the US as well as in, uh, in Canada, a preponderant number have never heard of Raoul Wallenberg, don't even know that he's an honorary citizen of the United States or of Canada, but Raoul Wallenberg can be an inspirational role model with respect to students. And that is why I'm delighted that in Canada now, uh, on Raoul Wallenberg commemorative day, we have called upon all high schools on January 17th to teach about the life and legacy of Raoul Wallenberg and to inspire students to understand how one person with the compassion to care, as I said, and the courage to act can confront evil and prevail. The next important objective is the need to, in fact, enhance not only the adoption, but the implementation of the IRA working definition on anti-Semitism. What is not so well known is that this IRA working definition is not only the most authoritative, comprehensive, and international consensus definition we have and that we reaffirm, but that it is the most democratically representative definition, one that was adopted over a 10-year decision-making process, one with, that was anchored in human rights law, equality rights law, our international treaty obligations to prohibit incitement to hostility, discrimination, and violence, treaty obligation on the International Covenant on Civil Employment. In other words, the IRA definition is anchored, if you will, in human rights law, in our uh, common uh, humanity. Combating hate crimes, I think what happened in Texas demonstrates the importance of what I call the four Ps, 
in combating anti-Semitic uh, hate crimes. And that is, uh, when I say the four Ps, the prevention of hate crimes to begin with, the protection of the targets, the per prosecution of the perpetrators, and partnerships between federal, uh, provincial, municipal uh, governments, and with civil society. What we saw with the synagogue in Texas, that in the immediate aftermath, it was characterized by an FBI agent as a random act unrelated to the Jewish community. That was later recanted, but the initial characterization and characterization as such by the media, associate press and others, demonstrates the importance of the IRA definition as a resource, as a tool, as an asset. Because if you can't identify, if you can't recognize anti-Semitism, you'll not be able to monitor it, let alone combat it. The next principle, the important one that I found in my year again as Special Envoy, is the zero tolerance policy for anti-Semitism as uh, in the political uh, culture, as well as in the campus culture. In other words, to guard against the weaponization of anti-Semitism, where Republicans call it out only amongst Democrats, or Democrats will call it out only against or it occurs amongst Republicans. This has to be a self-accounting. Every political party must call it out amongst its own. It has to be a zero tolerance policy with regard to anti-Semitism in the political culture and a zero tolerance policy with regard to anti-Semitism in the campus culture. And as we've seen in some reports emanating here, that with regard to uh, diversity, inclusion, equity, uh, DEI groups on the campus culture, there too in the US, the combating of anti-Semitism is marginalized. And in fact, at times uh, even uh, sanitized. And this brings me to the final two points uh, in this action plan for combating anti-Semitism. And that is the importance of allyship. I believe that we can find common allies if we work on the principle of intersectionality as we did in the struggle for Soviet jury, which you, Alvin, and others were involved. In fact, the interesting thing about it is that while intersectionality has emerged as at times a club uh, that in, adds to the indictment of Jews, I think intersectionality when it was patented by, in the struggle for Soviet Jewry is the way to take it. When we had, as we did at the time, women for Soviet Jewry, lawyers for Soviet Jewry, artists for Soviet Jewry, scientists for Soviet Jewry, academics for Soviet Jewry, parliamentary, I can go on. The point is with regard to the combating of anti-Semitism, we need that same form of allyships. We need that same uh, conglomeration of intersectionality. We need to be there for the other groups and we need to be able to call upon the other groups to be there for us. Because anti-Semitism, as we know only too well, cannot be fought, let alone won, by Jews acting alone. What we need at this point is a constituency of conscience, a critical mass along the lines of the struggle uh, for Soviet Jewry, a critical mass of advocacy, a global constituency of conscience to combat this global scourge targeting our common humanity and to mobilize this global constituency of conscience in the name of our common humanity. And to do that, we have to get out of the docket of the accused and we have to become the plaintiffs. We have to become <clears throat> the claimants. We have to become the advocates on behalf of that common humanity. Thank you.